Well, hello again, everyone. I want to welcome you to worship with us today. I'm Pastor Bill Hoffman from the Pine Island United Methodist Church. And today is Pentecost Sunday, a day we remember the powerful coming of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus' disciples in tongues of fire. It's a day that we remember not only the Spirit's coming, but also the start of the church. A church which has continued to be the presence of Jesus on this earth for 2,000 years. There have been many ups, downs, highs, and lows over those years, but the church has survived and will continue because the Holy Spirit is moving in, in it and through it. So as we prepare for worship today, please hear God's word and reflect on it and join me now in prayer. Dear God of heaven, we pray for your presence upon us as we gather together this day. We pray that we may be your church, your presence in this world. Grow our love for you and our love for each other, even as we gather at a distance. Teach us, show us, and give us courage to be the church, to go into the world with whatever it takes to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This is why we are here. We pray for your word to teach us, your spirit to empower us, and your presence to guide us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in the call to worship. We are the Easter people. We have witnessed the resurrection of our Lord. We are now called to be the people of the Pentecost. We are called to boldly share the good news of God's love. Open your hearts, O people, to God's great power and love. There are so many people who are lost and hurt who need the good news of Jesus Christ. God inspires us to be bold in our proclamation, unafraid, confident. Be with us as we step out boldly to share your good news. Amen. Today's scripture is Acts 2, 42 through 47. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayer. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple, ate in their homes, they shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. Good morning. Remember a few weeks back when we planted flower seeds so that we could grow plants to give them to a special friends? I hope you did you were able to do that and that your flowers were about ready to share with somebody special. And I hope your plants grew better than mine did. Look at my flower pot. Nothing grew. But I used some old seeds that have been around for a couple of years and I guess they weren't any good. But the seeds that we gave sent out to you folks uh, were all nice and fresh. So if you got some of those seeds, I bet they would have done better. If you'd like to send me pictures of you, the flowers, and maybe even giving them to a special friend, I'll work them into the children's sermon in two weeks. So if you send, if you want to send pictures, you can send them to my email address, bill at aplluscomputer.com. And that's printed in the manuscript that you've got uh, distributed with the service today. Today is Pentecost. 
It's a special day in the history of our church, and we celebrate that each year. It's the day that Jesus appeared to the early Christians and gave them the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, the church wasn't doing anything. It wasn't growing, it wasn't reaching people, it wasn't teaching people about Jesus. But after it got the Holy Spirit, it grew and it grew and it grew. And it got to the point where even, even we are today, including our church in Pine Island, all the way around the world from where the original church started. Think about a balloon for a minute. In fact, if you happen to have some balloons at your house, maybe you want to stop the video for just a minute and go uh, find some balloons and then you can blow yours up just like uh, I'll be doing here pretty quickly. The, the balloon without the air in it is kind of like our lives without the Holy Spirit. With, with, uh, with, without the Holy Spirit, our lives can't be all that God intended it to be, just like this balloon is, is pretty worthless. So before the Holy Spirit came, the church was lifeless, again, like the balloon. Church was not witnessing and wasn't telling people about Jesus. After the Holy Spirit breathed life into the church, people began telling everyone they saw about Jesus. And it didn't matter if the people spoke a different language. They still understood. Everyone they told about Jesus understood what they were saying. Thousands of people were added to the church. The church became alive and was doing the things God had commanded. Our lives and the life of our church are like this balloon. Without the Holy Spirit, without the air that's in here, it's worthless. It isn't what God intended us to be. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for providing us with the Holy Spirit. Help us to become all that you intend us to be. Amen. See you next week. Well, today I am in the sanctuary of our beautiful building, 
We can see the pipes of the church organ. We can see the beautiful windows and the stained glass, the lights above and the high ceiling. We see this beautiful sanctuary and realize that it was intended for it to put us in the mood to worship an awesome God, to worship the God who loves us, who cares for us, and provides for us. But this building, for all its beauty, is not the church. It is not the church, because we are the church. And no matter how beautiful this building may be, this is not the church. And the one thing I want us to understand is that this community that gathers in this place, and we hope we can gather in this place soon again, but we get in the habit too easily of calling this building the church. And uh, we need to get out of that and realize that even though we're not meeting here, the church still continues because we are the church. And we develop other habits that can also make us forget why our church is here in this community. And we want to talk about that today. A story is told about a church in Atlanta. The, uh, a man was visiting Atlanta and was looking at the Yellow Pages and under restaurants, he was trying to find a place to eat, he saw this one restaurant that was called the Church of God Grill. The Church of God Grill. So he was curious and he wondered how this church got its name, so he called them up and a man answered in a cheery voice saying, hello, this is the Church of God Grill. And he asked them why they had such an unusual name. Man at the other end said, well, we had a little mission down here. We started selling chicken dinners after church on Sunday to help pay the bills. Well, people like the chicken. And we did such a good business that eventually we cut back on the church services. After a while, we just closed the church down altogether and kept on serving the chicken dinners. We kept the name we started with, the Church of God Grill. You think sometimes people lose sight of their purpose? Do each of you know the mission that our church has, why we are here? Probably it's most clearly stated in Matthew 28. Jesus says to his disciples as he prepares to leave earth, he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always. Let's keep those words in our mind today as we look at the church and the Spirit's part in the church and our purpose in the church. In recent weeks, we've been experiencing what I might call Christianity 101. We've been going back to the basics, to the basics about God, about the Bible, about becoming a follower of Christ. And last week, we, thought about, we talked about our continuing journey of following Christ through our life. So what's left? We've talked about the meaning of the Christian faith for us personally. But what does it mean for us as the body of Christ? You know, what we call the church. What does it mean for us to be Christians together? Do we know why we exist? You know, does being in the church mean for you that it means how many people we get here on Sunday? Well, it's certainly true that in scriptures it says that we should not neglect the meeting of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing, but to encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. But is church attendance on Sunday really the goal of the church, the purpose? You know, if it is, then we need to institute uh, no excuse Sundays to make that a program so that everyone possible would be able to attend church. We would put full recliners in the back row uh, for those who Sunday is their only day to sleep in. We'd have steel helmets for those who say that the roof will cave in if I attended church. We'll have blankets uh, for those who say the church is too cold and fans for those who think it's too hot. We'll have headphones for those who say that 
people speak too softly from the pulpit. And we'll have noise-canceling headphones for those who think the pastor speaks too loud. We'll have scorecards available for those who want to make a list of all the hypocrites in the church. And one section will be devoted to trees and grass for those who like to see God in nature. There will be special private rooms with audio and video and a recliner for those who want to sit around in their boxer shorts and drink their coffee and read the paper. Finally, the sanctuary will be decorated with both Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies for those who have never seen the church without them. What do you think? Is this what the church was meant to be? Would it be worth us working to become that? Or like the earlier story, we could become the Methodist Bar and Grill or the Methodist Coffee House or the Methodist Kiwanis Club for that matter. But that is not our purpose. Our purpose is to make disciples. This is the only reason for the church to exist, and if we're not doing that, then can we really call ourselves a church? However we want to define it, the purpose of the church is to make disciples as we follow Christ together. That's what we call being the church, the body of Christ. Yet even if we don't gather in person on Sunday, as isn't as popular today as it used to be, we still need to connect in some way, at some time, in person or at a distance with technology, so we can encourage each other to love, to serve, to still fulfill our purpose of making disciples. Today, today we're going back. Today we're going back to look at what the church was like when it started. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the day we celebrate and remember the story we find in the second chapter of Acts about the coming of the Spirit. You see, the disciples were all gathered in one place, and this was a group of probably 120 people, not just the 12. And suddenly there's wind and flames of fire appear on the disciples' head, and they begin talking in different languages, and everyone is confused at this, is amazed at this, is wondering what's happening. And in the midst of this, in the same chapter, Peter stands up. Peter, the one who denied Jesus, and yet was also the person Jesus said would be the central figure to build his church. Peter stands up as a leader and speaks for the entire group. He explains what's happening. You see, Joel had prophesied that this would happen, this outpouring of the Spirit the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. And the life of Jesus showed them that Jesus is the Messiah, the one they were waiting for. The gospel of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascending to the right hand of God. And how the people who were listening had helped to put Jesus to death. It says in the Bible they were cut to the heart and wondered what they should do. And Peter ends his first sermon, the first sermon of the church in a sense, And Set tells them to be repent, to believe in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is central to the church. We don't talk about the Holy Spirit very often in the church, and yet this is the central uh, person of the Trinity for the church. You know, this story is the story of the first church, the first church gathering. All the characteristics of what we would call a a vital church are reflected in the few verses that were shared earlier. The scripture we're using today right at the end of Acts 2. As 3,000 people repent and are baptized, we then have a picture of how the first church lived out following Jesus Christ together. It says the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They learned from the disciples. How not to simply understand their faith, but how to live it in their lives. They invested in community, in fellowship. Relations with others were almost as important as a relationship with God. In fact, the two go together. You can't have one without the other. It says they shared meals. They shared food with simplicity, 
gladness and sincerity, breaking bread, sharing a meal, possibly sharing communion, although maybe not as we do it today. It could have been either one. It was probably both. They committed themselves to prayer. And they committed themselves to caring for one another. It says all believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. They were caring for those who were in need. You see, fellowship wasn't just about talk, but action. They cared for others at every level of life. And it says every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They praised God. It says they lived with joy and honesty and praise and worship for God. Joy and praise are common themes in Luke and Acts, as we indicated earlier. And it says a sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. You see, the Spirit didn't simply come upon the apostles. The Spirit continued to work through them to make things happen, to make things happen that got people's attention. And it says daily they were adding to the number of believers who were saved. They were making disciples. Well, so how does this story, this picture of the church, the very first church, how does it apply to us today? How does it apply to our church, to the churches around us? Well, number one, remember we talked about our becoming a disciple was about being up, our relationship to God, in with the people in the church, and out to people in the rest of the world. How are we learning together? This is an in function. How are we learning together from God's word? Everyone who is a follower of Christ needs to have a place to grow in their faith through two things, through not only studying God's word, which is really an up function, and doing it with other people. Number two is fellowship. That's also an in function. Are we truly in fellowship with each other? You know, do we really care what happens to the person next to us? Are we really sharing ourselves with each other together? It's interesting what John, in the first letter that we have of him in in chapter 4, it says, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. But whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You know, we may not hate people, but failing to love and getting involved in other people's lives has pretty much the same effect as if we did. And we have a third one that's all part of this in function is the breaking of the bread together. You know, this includes communion, but it also means sharing meals with each other. You know, I think there's a little bit of communion in every meal that we share with others. And there's nothing like sharing a meal to break down barriers, to draw people together, to get people to know each other. And how do we share our meals? With joy, simplicity, and sincerity. This is the mark of a follower of Christ. Number four, prayer. Making our connection with God. This is the up part. But I think it's important we talk about how we pray. When we pray together in worship or in a small group of people, we should think about praying for the mission of God in the world, for his kingdom to come. Praying for community, for growing in faith for others. We should pray... Pray for our love of God for each other. Pray for the presence and movement of the Spirit in our lives. And pray specifically for God to act through us together. Number five is now brings us to the out part of this. Caring for others has to go beyond those we know. It goes out to everyone who has need. There are people in this community... There are those who are poor, who don't have enough to eat, who don't always have heat or adequate shelter, people who are simply lonely, cut off from others. We, can, we need to stop responding 
to deny these situations really exist. They're here. We need to allow these people that we don't normally associate to become visible to us. Not to go about our day ignoring them. And there's sometimes that I know we feel that others don't really deserve our help. But Jesus didn't tell us to only help those who we think deserve it. Jesus said we should love even our enemies. We should do good to those who speak against us. Jesus calls us to care for others whether or not we think they deserve it. You know, Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. We still don't deserve that. And yet, God gave us his grace, and he asks us to extend grace to others. In the book of James, chapter 2, It says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And then the sixth thing is about worship. This is an up function. We can certainly worship God alone in our homes. We can worship God in nature, but the New Testament reflects over and over the importance of worshiping God together, even if it's just long distance over technology. Jesus said in Matthew 18, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. And we call for the presence of God to be with us as we gather to worship. There is the presence and power of the Spirit of Jesus in this place as we meet together for worship each Sunday. Whether we're physically present or worship at a distance, we need to come each week expecting to meet God in this place. And finally, number seven, we have the work of the Spirit, that continuing work of the Spirit that made people amazed at what was going on with those early disciples and joined. 3,000 after Peter's first sermon. You see, if we follow the path of Jesus Christ, the Spirit will be at work to grow the church. When the people saw, it says, the joy and fellowship of the early church, they couldn't help but be drawn to it. And when people see our joy and love for each other, they can't help but being drawn to us by the Holy Spirit. But even in this first church, there was something missing. We see later in the book of Acts, this sudden dispersion where there's a persecution that starts and the people that had come to Jerusalem and experienced Pentecost, people from all over, suddenly were driven out and went back to their home, wherever they had come from, all around the Mediterranean basin. And we think that's a bad thing. It's terrible that they had to be persecuted. You know, the Jews just got to the point of saying they couldn't put up with a sect anymore. And then we have Saul uh, standing there to watch Stephen being stoned. And he led the beginning of this persecution. But this is the final piece of what it means to be a church. We need to go into all the world. Many people fled and spread the good news of Jesus Christ in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, just like the table of contents says at the beginning of Acts. You know, being the church involves sacrifice. And I hope we don't have to wait for persecution to drive us out of this building. There are people hurting out there that need our love and help. And they need to know the good, Jesus, the good news of Jesus Christ right here in our community. You know, someone did a survey back, I know it was in South Dakota, but uh, they found in general most average-sized towns, and we say Pine Island would be roughly that size, only about 16% of the people consider church attendance or being part of a church, an active part of a church, to be important. They don't know what they're missing. And we don't know what we're missing if we're not reaching out to them. God wants to bless us richly with his grace through the Spirit. 
and the Spirit has promised to go with us. We have inherited great riches, the great riches of the Spirit of God. It's like the story I shared earlier of the oil well beneath Mr. Yates' feet. Let's tap into the riches of the Spirit and what the Spirit has for us and allow the Spirit to work in each of our lives. Pray for courage to do what we can do to make disciples and allow God to use us boldly, as our prayer says, to be the church. And I leave you with the promise and encouragement of God himself from the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, chapter 29. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Go in peace. Amen. Once again, we want to close our time together in prayer. First of all, with our breakthrough prayer, and then the Lord's Prayer. Please pray with me. Gracious God of light, lead your Pine Island United Methodist Church to break through our barriers and distractions in new and miraculous ways. Help us discern how you are calling this church to dream, what you are calling this church to be, and who you are calling this church to reach. We know you are able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Give us courage and use us boldly in your God-sized plans. Amen. And again, also the, the prayer that the, our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please receive now the blessing of the Lord. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all, now and forever. Amen. And as you go forth today, I hope you will join us uh, as your spirit is being renewed for the new week to join us in our sending song, O Church of God United.